also thinking a little bit about um, this particular article that was really influential in my own uh, training um, around sustainability and thinking a little bit about what has updated and what hasn't since that was published. Um, I'm going to visit briefly this discourse, this conversation around voting with your fork. And when we look at the changes that we want to bring about in the food system, the idea of consumption-based politics or you know, voting your way to a better meal or eating your way to a better food system is something that is often um, thought about with you know, relative ease. And while there's certainly some important uh, dynamics of that, I want to talk with you about a little bit. Um, and then I'll take a turn and think a little bit about um, what we've seen in the last few years because of the pandemic and conversations around essential work and essential workers. Um, as we you know, think back to just over three years ago now, um, the conversations around who was permitted to work, who was needed to work, and who was able to work at home um, showed very different um, realities about people's livelihoods and about how they earn their money. Um, I'll briefly revisit some of the work that I did um, for my first book um, around labor in Vermont's dairy industry, really focusing in particular on some of the current um, campaign work around worker-driven social responsibility. And then I'll get into that optimistic future where I see the kind of limits of hope um, in the future. So a piece that I read in graduate school in 19, I didn't read it in 1991, I, it was published in 1991, um, is an article called The Social Side of Sustainability, and it's written by Patricia Allen and Carolyn Sachs, who are amazing feminist food scholars who have really thought very carefully about the ways in which gender and inequality and and in this article, this is kind of where we saw the beginning conversations around what sustainable agriculture meant. Um, and this was as we started seeing sort of the mainstreaming of sustainable agriculture. So in this piece, what they talk about is that we really need to kind of unpack what we mean by sustainability. Um, and that at that time, and I would argue still, we still really focus heavily on the ecological side of sustainability, right? The, the sort of tangible, visible, physical side of sustainability. Um, and what they say is, while the dominant discourse on sustainable agriculture does raise important problems, there's a tendency to overlook problems such as hunger, poverty, systemic economic concentration, gender subordination, and racial oppression. Um, problems that also contribute to a lack of sustainability in the food and agriculture system. And so while this piece was written many years ago now, um, I think this argument still really holds true. And that when we look at conversations around sustainability in our food systems and agricultural systems, um, we still don't pay as much attention to sort of those social dimensions as we do with the ecological and the physical. And so this idea of sustainability has made its way in some interesting ways into UBM's definition into the European Food Information Center's definition of sustainability. And this sort of tripartite this definition where we can think about sustainability in terms of environmental or ecological dimensions, economic or financial dimensions, and social dimensions, um, I think is really important. But the way that I also think about it is that it's sort of like a rickety three-legged stool where two of those legs are pretty substantially discussed and that other leg where we're thinking about social inequality, structural inequality, structural racism, poverty, um, sexism is not necessarily paying the same attention. And as I've been exploring dimensions around labor in these cases, I think this is really particularly the case. So um, what I'll be thinking about today is really how work fits into this picture and how labor in the food system to me is that dimension of social sustainability that we need to really not only think about, but think about in terms of policy, in terms of action, in terms of worker organizing. And um, I'll think about that hopefully with you. So again, that Allen and Sachs piece was published um, in 1991. And of course, there's been tremendous amounts of food scholarship and popular food writing that has happened since 1991. Um, but when we look at some of the more recent writing, this is um, by Leah Penniman in Farming While Black, uh, published in 2018. She not only situates 
structural inequality is sort of a, a symptom of a broken food system, but actually as one of the root causes. So she argues that racism is built into the DNA of the US food system, beginning with the genocidal land theft from indigenous people, continuing with the kidnapping of our ancestors from the shores of West Africa for forced agricultural labor, expanding to the migrant guest worker program and maturing into its current state where farm management is among the whitest professions. Farm labor is predominantly brown and exploited and people of color disproportionately live in food apartheid neighborhoods and suffer from diet related illness. She concludes the system is built on stolen land and stolen labor and needs a redesign. So there's a number of years that have been passed, right, that have passed since the publication of that first piece and the publication of this piece. And I think the fact that we are still really grappling with um, these realities indicates that that social dimension of a sustainable food system needs our, needs our drastic attention. Um, and if you are at all interested in some of these ideas, both um, Alan and Zach's broader work and um, the Farming World Black Book are just incredible resources. And I, I really highly recommend them um, in anyone's reading list. So how this plays out, and I think that one of the important things that Pennant draws attention to is that there is a shared concern among different kinds of workers in the food system, right? And across different time periods that we can trace the legacies of the plantation system, right, to current day realities. And of course, it's important to note that there are still cases of human bondage and slavery in our food system. And at the same time, there's also ways that we might think about shared struggle between these workers or these groups of workers and consumers that um, perhaps will get us to a better future. And I think that that's um, something that we need to pay a lot of attention to. So um, one of the things that I've been spending the last, oh gosh, three years on, is writing with my colleague, Laura Ann Mika who is a geography professor at Syracuse, um, a book called Will Work for Food, Labor Across the Food System. And we've been calling this our pandemic project um, because as two researchers who are used to going out to the field and talking to people and sharing space with people, our research methods became really challenging with the pandemic. Um, it wasn't very possible, and in fact at UVM it wasn't permitted for us to do that kind of research for a number of months. And a number of um, qualitative researchers or um, people using oral history have, have moved to Zoom, and I think that's really exciting. Um, but for us, we were thinking, what can we accomplish in this uncertain future that will still continue some of the thoughts that we both raised in our first books? So in this book, what we're trying to do is we're trying to trace what work looks like in various sectors of the food system, from production, through processing, distribution and logistics, retail, home-based labor, and uh, service and waste. And as we've been doing this work, um, there's some really striking uh, numbers that I think we want to grapple with because there are certainly ways that food work can be good work, and especially like working as a server and fine dining might bring you a relatively okay income. Much more commonly, uh, or much more common is the fact that that work is not necessarily well paid, well um, benefited, or um, necessarily something with a lot of uh, advancement potential. So Joanne Lowe, who is um, a really important food researcher, um, wrote this piece back, well, again, before the pandemic. And what we see in these, these realities have not changed much, is that frontline food workers make the lowest median hourly wage in the US economy. And so these are workers who often, during the pandemic, we're, we're facing sort of increased risks of, of getting ill. And as their lives were on the line, they were still not making very much money. We know that food workers use food stamps at twice the rate of the US workforce average. And when you look at the use of uh, SNAP benefits, um, this also is particularly concentrated in um, food service work, workers for fast food restaurants, um, workers in retail, and what this tells us is this broader reality that food workers don't have enough food. And that's one of those big dilemmas and contradictions that I've spent um, now the last 10 years of my life really thinking about. We know that more than a third of food workers experience wage theft in any given week, and this can take various forms. 
This might be shaving a little bit off um, of a time card. This might be shaving a little bit off of tips. This might be outright wage theft of undocumented workers and withholding like a paycheck illegally. And so wage theft is a really um, predominant experience in food work, as is illness and injury. Um, I think any of us who have worked in a kitchen, either professionally or at home, know the dangers that come along with that. The burns, the scalds, um, the ergonomic uh, kinds of problems, the back pain. But when we look at um, workers across the food system, there is a, a big range of injury from those sort of superficial injuries to death. And um, especially when we look at things like dairy work and meat packing work, <coughs> those are some of the most dangerous occupations of all occupations. We also know that immigrant workers are often fearful of deportation and because of citizenship, or the lack of citizenship, often have to tolerate these conditions because they don't feel like they can file grievances or raise concerns. And so I think we have to kind of come to terms with this not so great picture before we can reimagine things and before we can think about what could this look like that is different, right? Or what are the alternatives here? And so one of the things I think is also important to think about is where are these workers? So this is, um, these are some data that will be going into our new book. And when we look across the food system, we can see where these workers are concentrated. Roughly 22 million workers um, were working in the food system in 2021. This is as we were sort of easing out of the acute pandemic phase, um, as things were starting to reopen. And of those 22 million workers, over 10 million of them are working in food service. And so the concentration is really in restaurants, fast food, fast casual, any kind of um, cafeteria, um, or even food service in schools. And that's also where we see the lowest median hourly wages. So what's really interesting um, through our research that we've done for this are comparing things like the rate of unionization, right? That we actually see relatively high numbers of unionization in um, waste management. That's also where we see higher wages. Um, we see very low rates of unionization in restaurant work, um, in fast food work, and in agricultural work. Um, and part of that has some policy reasons behind it, and in many ways, the prohibition of collective bargaining for farm workers. And so these wages, again, if we're thinking about someone you know, living in Burlington, Vermont, which is extremely expensive place to live right now, and working in food service, earning you know an average of twenty-nine thousand dollars a year. These are poverty-level wages. Right? These are not livable wages. Just to kind of demonstrate that concentration of workers, um, we can look at this chart where the number of people working in food service is just out of sight compared to some of these other sectors. And part of this is due to the different ways that we feed ourselves and the different ways that across history we have moved from spending the majority of our dollars as a nation for food that is prepared at home to food that is prepared outside the home. Um, my colleague Amy Trubeck um, at UVM wrote a book called The Ma'at. Uh, oh my gosh, I'm going to totally blank on live stream. <coughs> Amy Trubeck, Making Modern Meals. And what she argues is that you know, now I think it's something like 52, 53% of our money is set on food outside the home. And that is not just about, you know, the results of feminism. That's not just about some of these bigger changes. It's also about these economic pressures, right? That if you're working increasing number of hours to pay for that rent in Burlington, you're more likely than before to eat food outside the home, right? So our food industry has really changed. Um, and it's really changed in terms of where we see these greater numbers of workers, um, but also where we're spending our food dollars. And you know, I, I know as a as a working mom, you know, takeout is becoming increasingly easy, um, and easy and easier. And especially with the pandemic, right? We have different ways of eating. So, in many respects, there are conversations of, well, if you don't like what's happening in the food system show your preference through buying something different, right? If you don't like what's happening, buy that fair trade avocado versus the avocado that may be linked to human bondage, right? And I think that there's some potential there, and I don't want to discount, you know, that there is 
some potential and some power in choosing where to spend your money, you know, very intentionally. Um, but I also think that if we rely only on consumption-based politics, and this is something that Joanne Lowe emphasizes in that piece, we're not going to get very far, right? Because a couple of people, or even a hundred people, or even a thousand people, choosing that fair trade avocado doesn't make a big enough dent in the patterns of labor in our food system. So I think there's another reality that sometimes that voting with our fork is also just about making ourselves feel better, right? which is not a bad thing, right? It's okay to feel better that you're buying, you know, the locally produced milk in the glass jar versus something that you know nothing about the origins. But whether it actually makes a dent in these bigger systems is, is a little bit unclear. And there's also this reality that this is not a democratic system, right? If we're thinking about voting, as the way in which we enact democracy, right? One of the ways. If you have less money to spend on food, that means you have less power over your food. And that's not fair, right? That means that if you have less money, you have less ability to engage in your values, right? Put your own sort of morals and values into your consumption. And I also think that that's really problematic, meaning that lower income people somehow can't consume ethically. Right, because of that limitation. However, as we've seen across history, whether we're looking at the UFW boycotts, the great boycotts in the 60s and 70s, or if we're looking at more contemporary uh, practices where, um, for example, the LA school district decides to completely change their purchasing behavior, scaled up consumer power actually is really hopeful. Um, and there's cases of, again, school districts there's cases of, um, let's see, higher education um, decision making. There's, edu there's uh, places where large restaurant firms will make decisions. And that kind of consumption-based politics that is more about groups of consumers has a lot of potential. And I'll talk a little bit about where we have seen that happening in Vermont and where um, we might want to put some attention towards. So this idea of voting with your fork, right? This comes from, in some ways, some of those popular food writers, right? The Mark Bittmans, the Michael Pollans, who are beautiful writers and have a lot to say. But this idea of you vote three times a day with your meals really doesn't get us far, quite honestly. Um, and at the same time, we also know that money spent in the local economy tends to circulate more, right? So there's no black or white with this issue. There's a lot of gray area, actually. So, 2020 um, was a really interesting year in food systems. Um, it was a really interesting year to be a university professor. I was reflecting with some of my students this year um, about that, that semester we all had to go home at spring break and turn to remote learning. And we have really kind of, we're in a new normal in a lot of ways. With our food system, in some ways, we're at sort of a new old normal, where some things that were very persistent and patterned before the pandemic have come back, like going out to eat, going out to eat without a mask for some. But at the same time, there are some really interesting changes that have happened. So when we look at some of the immediate things that were happening in the very early and very acute phase of the pandemic, what we saw is this really interesting new conversation around essential workers, right? And when we looked at who those workers were, you know, they were, of course, healthcare workers. They were, of course, um, um, any kind of emergency workers, police officers, right? The people who could not work from home, who could not do their work from home. At the same time, there were also restaurant workers, to some degree, school food providers. There were meat packers, there were chicken processors, there were farm workers. And what we saw is this really interesting kind of public dialogue of whose work is essential in our food system, in our world, right? Not just our food system. And at the same time, there was this kind of parallel conversation happening of, are these essential workers or are they sacrificial workers? Because what we know is that when we look at the mortality rates among, uh, for example, meat packers and chicken processors, that there was no way to socially distance. There was no way of having adequate PPE. And in those kinds of working contexts where people are so tightly packed, that was literally breeding ground 
there are all kinds of other ways that designating, for example, the meat industry as part of our critical infrastructure, which was an executive order under the Trump administration, kept those workers on the job and kept those facilities open, even as we knew they were done. So this conversation of essential work has a lot of different dimensions to it. And I remember at UVM, when we were on this hiring freeze, you had to make a very hard case for how a job was essential. And certain, um, certain work, like working with farm workers through UVM Extension, was deemed essential. Um, and we could get permission, for example, for some employees to be hired through that route. But by and large, university <laughs> professors were not considered essential enough in this way, right? And we could also work from home. And despite the, the difficulties of doing that, that was an incredible privilege and luxury of being able to do our work from home, making our salaries, and not putting our lives at risk to do our job. In Vermont, what this also looked like are some really phenomenally interesting things that happened. And so when we saw those rounds of stimulus funds, right, coming from the federal government, there, that was not open to everyone equally. And if you were undocumented, you did not get a stimulus fund uh, check. If you were filing taxes in a household with someone who was undocumented, you didn't get that stimulus check. Um, and so what we did as a state is something actually kind of phenomenal. And because of organizing work on the part of, I believe it was, um, it was Minor Justice, I believe, no Fed in rural Vermont, that we actually created a fund at the state level where people who were excluded from that federal stimulus um, package could get a stimulus check. And we saw numbers of farm workers accessing this money. Again, essential workers who are still milking cows, who are still showing up to, to their jobs. At the same time, what was interesting is places like my own loved co-op city market. Um, you know, this is the South End location. There was a lot of really active conversation and argument around questions of like hazard pay. And hazard pay was extended for quite a while. City market uh, management put an end to that. The workers who are organized and unionized demanded restoration of that hazard pay. And again, these are happening in these spaces of very kind of progressive food politics, right? A unionized food cooperative is having these conversations around essential work. And so, these national things that were happening around who is essential, what kinds of work are they doing that is essential, you know, this is happening in our own backyards. And of course in Vermont we saw things like uh, milk being dumped, right, because there was no place to take that fluid milk as schools were closed. We saw the National Guard, I believe, um, distributing gallons of milk just for free because people were hungry and we had too much milk. Right? So these things, um, that are happening at this national level also were happening. So to bring this again a little bit closer to some of the research that I've done, um, this first book that I wrote in 2019, which was the reason that I was here last time, um, there's been a lot of things that have happened with the farm worker community with COVID. And interestingly, initially, some of the isolation that they had, that they continue to have, and some of sort of the the dislocation or the social marginalization actually protected people from getting sick at first. And talking with colleagues in the healthcare field and in public health, there was this kind of moment where it was like, okay, is that isolation actually a protective thing for COVID um, infection among farm workers? Of course, once people started getting sick, the close living quarters, the close working quarters, um, the, the virus spread very quickly, like we saw in other elements of the food system. So what we know in our state, and according to UVM Extension data, there's roughly 1,000 to 1,200 farm workers in the state of Vermont. Um, that number has stayed fairly consistent, um, even with the pandemic, and some of that is because it became very difficult to travel, very difficult to return to Mexico if you wanted to. Um, roughly 90% of these workers are undocumented, and most of them are coming from southern Mexico, also from uh, countries in Central America. And it's a mostly male workforce. So something important, I wanna always emphasize this in every talk that I give, is this rate of undocumented workers, which some estimate is actually much higher than 90%, is 
in part, in large part, to the fact that there is no legal pathway into working in the dairy industry. You cannot get an H-2A seasonal work permit to work in dairy because dairy happens year-round. So in Vermont, we do have agricultural workers coming through the H-2A program to, for example, work in the orchard industry, but that is a seasonal job, right? And those workers who are sometimes and often, actually, from the Caribbean, go back home and then come back that next season. Dairy work doesn't happen in that same cycle. And there have been arguments that perhaps we want to expand the H-2A program to include dairy work. And I also think that's not the best solution. Um, the H-2A program is well known to be a, a, a flawed program in a lot of ways. Um, a lot of potential for worker abuse and a lot of potential for um, kind of exploitation within some of these farms. And so even though there's a lot of amazing employers going through the H-2A program, I don't think that model is necessarily the best one. When we look at some of the things that have shifted in our dairy industry more broadly, is that even as we know farm work is very difficult work, owning a dairy in Vermont is also incredibly difficult. And the changes that we've seen in the broader food system, where we have fewer entities in control, right, is happening in our own dairy industry. Um, I always have to update the second number. Um, we know that in the 1940s, there were about 11,000 dairies. In 2012, that dropped to 1,000. The most recent numbers that I looked up this week show about 600 dairies. Mm -hmm. And we are making more milk with those 600 dairies than we did in the 1940s because in part, we're milking cows more often, herds are getting larger, dairy farms are getting larger, feed is getting more productive in that way, um, and the animal genetics are also changing. So at the same time where we see um, you know, this change in the overall dairy economy, we also know that nearly 70% of Vermont's milk comes from farms that employ farm workers from outside the country. And that's about 43% of New England's milk supply. And so when we come to sort of terms with our own agricultural economy in the state, um, we're the most dependent state on one commodity in the nation, and that commodity is milk. And so if we have significant trouble in our dairy industry, we have significant economic issues more broadly. And as we saw with COVID and well before, dairy is extremely volatile as an industry. And the commodity pricing that farmers get here is tied to production um, standards in the Midwest. And that is a very different reality in terms of the, sale, the scale and the size of farming that people are doing. So one of the things that's happened alongside these changes is that for farm owners to stay afloat, especially as farms are forced to get larger and larger, is that they increasingly are hiring farm workers from outside of the country, and again, mostly from Mexico. And what we've seen, I got here in 2011, what we've seen is an incredible change in the acknowledgement that farm workers are present in our state and an awareness of some of the conditions that they're working within. So what we saw in 2017, to me, is absolutely momentous. And I talk about it quite a bit in chapter five of <coughs> the first book, where the Milk with Dignity Agreement was signed with Ben & Jerry's. Um, and Ben & Jerry's was a very likely first company to bring on board. I'll talk a little bit about worker-driven social responsibility in a minute. But what this means currently is that all farms in Vermont and some in New York that are providing Ben and Jerry's with milk, all those farms are following a farm worker authored code of conduct. That means that farm workers are getting education, they're um, being paid fairly, um, there's zero tolerance for sexual harassment on the job, and there's a number of important um, dignified characteristics of work that people have to follow. In order to allow that, what happens is that Ben & Jerry's pays a premium to those farm owners, and those farm owners use that money to enable those conditions. And so back when I spoke about you know, the individual purchasing decisions having a negligible impact, when a large company decides to enact changes, that's where we see really big impact. 
And so the Milk with Dignity Agreement was signed in October of 2017. Um, and for me, it was this really meaningful moment as someone who had volunteered with Migrant Justice for a number of years and also was on the board for four and a half years. I'm on my sabbatical from the board and hopefully we'll be returning um, sometime this year. Right now we're seeing the campaign extend to Hannaford's and Migrant Justice just wrapped up a huge tour, a huge set of educational events um, where they're trying to encourage Hannaford to also bring their store brand milk and dairy products into the Milk with Dignity program. And it's something I think we all really need to pay attention to. What's really exciting about this though is that this is not the only case. And the Milk with Dignity program is, it's not a union program. I think that's really important to underscore. That Migrant Justice is not a workers union. They follow more of a workers center model. But they have colleagues that are using these kinds of models in lots of other industries. And the Coalition of Mockley Workers, um, based in Florida, was one of the first groups to use this model in the food system, and it's had tremendous changes for um, uncovering cases of human slavery, of improving conditions for workers down there, and of making the, the needs of farm workers much more well known. So these groups are connected in something called the Worker Driven Social Responsibility Network. And this network, um, I'm really interested in networks and how people work together in collaborations. And this network is made up not just of food workers. The Coalition of Milwaukee Workers is involved in it, Migrant Justice is involved in it, but so is Venceremos, which is a group of chicken processing workers who are trying to also organize and um, bring better working conditions to Tyson plants. Um, it involves United Students Against Sweatshops, who is trying to work on making sure that the garments that are sold with university logos are not produced in sweatshops. And there's some really exciting things that are happening in this network. How this is different from what we see sort of corporate social responsibility is in its name worker driven. That when you ask a worker what they need for dignified work, to me, that holds more water or more weight than asking the CEO that is making $40 million a year, right? He's that person, likely if he is making plenty of money and probably has okay working conditions. But when we're looking at these frontline workers, right, those workers who are putting their lives on the line and continue to, they know what needs to happen for them to have a good and healthy workplace. And at the same time, what happens within worker-driven social responsibility is that these agreements are legally binding. So the contracts that are signed within these worker-driven models actually have legal weight to them. And for example, in the Milk with Dignity program, if uh, there are some restorative measures that can happen if someone falls out of the code of conduct. But what that means is that you can terminate a purchasing agreement, right? Or a, if, if, a, if a company, um, if a farm does not follow um, the codes of conduct. There's also something where a lot of times in certain critiques of fair trade and things like you know direct trade is that the monitoring of those systems is often done by the company themselves. <laughs> and of course the company themselves is like, yeah, we're doing okay, right? But what we see is that within worker-driven social responsibility is that there's a third-party monitor that actually brings workers into that process. And for example, within the Milk with Dignity program, um, workers can call the Milk with Dignity Standards Council if they feel the code of conduct has not been followed. So I just want to show this if you're interested in this model. Um, if you look at the Milk with Dignity Standards Council website, they have the results of the first five years of the program um, with Ben and Jerry's. And currently, as of the time this was published, um, there were 209 uh, qualifying workers. Again, 209 out of 1,000 to 1,200, pretty good ratio, um, on 51 participating farms in Vermont and New York. There were $3.4 million invested in workers' wages and bonuses and improvements in labor and housing conditions. Over 1,000 inquiries from workers and farmers into the worker support line. 183 farm audits, 212 program education sessions, and 1,300 audit findings, which actually part of this program is what's called corrective action plans, 
where if something is kind of slipping or falling out of the code, there's actually a way of bringing the human back into the code, right, rather than just kicking them out, with the exception of sexual harassment. There's a zero tolerance policy for that. And so I've been tremendously inspired by this program and the, the broader network that is engaging in worker-driven social responsibility, especially when we look at workers who don't have the protection of citizenship, policy changes in our elected sort of levels of government, governance don't always go easily, right? And these kinds of models that are actually happening within the purchasing arrangements can go quicker, actually. They can, they can be uh, implemented quicker. They can be implemented without these questions of citizenship that I think are incredibly important when we look at the reality that something like 80% of our food in the United States passes through an undocumented person's hands. So I'm tremendously inspired by this. Um, and I really encourage you, if you're curious, um, the, both Migrant Justice and the Muppet Dignity Standards Council has a really great set of information, and this report is really, really interesting. So I feel good about being optimistic. I'm in a field where often I'm really sad <laughs> and where I'm frustrated and where I'm depressed. And even as we've seen COVID be absolutely catastrophic on so many levels, it's also been a moment of reckoning in some really important ways. And it's been a place where my co-author and I are talking about it as perhaps this is another opening for thinking about food and farm workers, right? We can look historically at these moments, right? The publication of The Jungle highlighted cases of largely lack of hygiene in um, the stockyards of Chicago, or things like the, the production of the documentary Harvest of Shame, right? And Ed Murrow, sort of in his dramatic voice, talking about, you know, this is America, and these are our workers. To me, this is another one of those moments, and I think we really have to seize it if we're going to think about um, the potential here. So some things that make me happy when I look at food labor is that we're seeing very real wins of the Fight for 15 campaign, where in cities like New York City and we're in Portland, Maine, we are seeing increases of minimum wage at municipal levels that are often higher than the state level. I think that's really exciting. Um, what we know is that as of 2022, we are at the highest point of union approval that we've seen since 1965. And right now, about 71% of respondents to the Gallup poll approve of unions. That's the highest rate since my parents got married. And that's really exciting to me, a couple of years after they got married. We are seeing increasingly really interesting and exciting union successes. Um, Starbucks currently has voted to unionize in 300 locations at the time of this writing. Um, this happened in just about two years that they started this drive in Buffalo, New York in December of 2021. As of the end of 2022, there were 300 locations that were unionized. It's the fastest rate of union growth for any company in the last 20 years. Chipotle is organizing during the pandemic Almost 90% of cafeteria workers in Google cafeterias voted to unionize. And as of me reading seven days over dinner, right as I got here, <laughs> Ben and Jerry Scoop Shop is working on unionizing. And so regardless of complicated views on unions, we do know that they bring better working conditions. I'm a unionized faculty member. I was a unionized graduate student. And I know that my working conditions would have been different without those, those structures in place. There's also this reality that this great resignation that we're talking about, right, is making companies work harder to get employees and keep employees. I drive by a bagel shop um, on my way to work every day. Starting pay is $25 an hour. I'm like, maybe I should be a bagel worker again. I've done it before, I could do it again. Um, but what we are seeing is that as people you know, were often forced out of work in the restaurant and service industry, they started thinking, hmm, do I really want to go back? And we're seeing starting wages of $15 at McDonald's and higher. We're seeing benefits actually go up. And that is interesting that by withholding workers or withholding potential employees, companies have to do better. And I think that that's actually really exciting. Um, 
hopefully UVM gets on that board as well. There's also the fact that as we were in the pandemic and you know as we're flowing out of whatever this new reality is, is that there's increasing networks. As we all got online and on Zoom, right, the ability to organize actually improved. And the ability to get on Zoom sessions with workers across the country, right, is opening up new ways for workers to work across sectors. And actually the fight for 15 is not just restaurant workers, it's restaurant workers and sanitation workers and adjunct professors. Mm. And those kind of cross-sector collaborations are really exciting to me. So when we're looking at this better food system, right, I think that we have a blueprint of what not to do. I think that we have some really influential thinkers like Alan, Sachs, Penniman, that are pointing to, we're not trying to create something from the past, right? We're not trying to go back to some romantic house. We need something fundamentally different. And I do think that, you know, if we seize this moment, if we really think about using this moment of greater tension to potentially really fundamentally re rework our labor system within, within food, um, I personally am very excited about it. Um, so I'm gonna end there. I'm happy to talk more about any of these things, about the book that's coming out, about The Most Costly Journey, which is the book that the Humanity Center has been so helpful in, not Humanity Center, Council. Um, has been so helpful in, in getting out into every library, it seems, in every every school classroom. Um, but I'll stop there and drink some water and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. And I think there's a way to do it online too. If we can. Yeah, what's interesting with the online is that people are about 15 seconds behind us. So oh. <laughs> you haven't yet asked for questions. I will ask for questions. <laughs> <laughs> something different than it.
I'm trying to figure out how to phrase this question. Um, there are migrant dairy workers, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Many in Vermont. Mm -hmm. And I relatively recently learned that they're, you know, within 20 minutes of Norwich, right? Oh, yeah. Yep. Living in shadows. Yes. And so then let's say you shine a light on that. Yep. What happens to the workers? That's a hugely important question, and it's a really important question for a researcher um, who has to follow very careful protocols for research. And so in my research, in my book, I never use someone's actual name. I never use their exact location. The broad strokes of where they're from and their families are broad strokes, right? And so it's really interesting because as a researcher, anytime we're doing um, qualitative work with humans, human subjects, we have to explain how our research is not going to put them at greater risk than their daily lives. So I have to follow a ton of my own ethical guides, but also guides from the university about what I can and cannot do. It's also really interesting because if you look at the popular representation of farm workers in Vermont, that has changed completely like 180 since I got here, right? And that idea of people being in the shadows, of course that is still very much a reality, but you also have a cable access show that's run by Migrant Justice that talks about these issues, right? You have very public campaigns and debates and organizing efforts, and so in some way this greater visibility that has been brought to farm workers is because of that farm worker organizing. And there have been consequences for that visibility. And, you know, if you follow sort of some of these histories, we know that after some of these organizing events, people have been detained. So when we look at sort of the broader shining of the light onto farm workers, I think there's a difference between people taking that choice to, sh to shine the light on themselves, which is happening, and me as a researcher shining that light, or you know, a cartoonist <laughs> for the most costly journey shining that light, in that we know that it's not our, our, it's our life is on the line, or our ability to stay in Vermont is not on the line, and so we've, I personally, follow very strict guidelines about how to represent people. If you notice in my book, no faces are shown, um, names are all actually triple coded. <laughs> Um, and when I do, whenever I do share Im images of farm workers, which I have a certain set of permissions to do for a program that I help coordinate, I have made the choice since 2016 to only show images of people who have since returned to Mexico. And so that line of, of visibility is a really um, delicate one to walk, but I also think that there are so many really important cases where farm workers are stepping into that spotlight, you know, organizing that work, you know, going to Mount Pelier, and um, in some ways with full awareness, not in some ways, in, with always in full awareness of the consequences of doing that. Um, I also, <laughs> when I got here in 2011, um, so I got here in 2011, I was planning on doing this research, and it was maybe two months after I started teaching at UVM, and there's this really high-profile arrest of a farm worker leader up in Franklin County. He and another worker were being driven by their employer, and they were pulled over because the driver was either speeding or had a tail light out, got arrested, um, and large protests were happening up in the Border Patrol offices up in Franklin County. And I was completely flabbergasted when our former governor went on public record and said, our official policy, or sort of our policy in Vermont is to look the other way. And I was like, wow, that's, you're not gonna see that in Florida, <laughs> right? <laughs> that there's Especially this recognition that our state is dependent on these workers, and, you know, for someone to say that, on record, cited everywhere, is an indication that even though Vermont isn't unique in a lot of ways, like there are some unique features of this state. And I think, um, for better or worse, um, there's a recognition that these workers are here, not for work, 
not seeing raids, <laughs> right? We're not seeing raids on farms like we see raids on the packing plants. Part of that is that we don't have 300 workers in one place. Kind of a related yeah. question, if I if I might. Yeah. Um, so it's partially a visa question. Yep. Um, if there is any effort to try to categorize dairy workers so that they can have. Yep. And and then kind of related to that, then is you know the, the history of immigration, of course, is mm -hmm. is and, and what I'm hearing in the community that's mm -hmm. changing here is it was originally starting as you know young single men mm -hmm. and now there's there's more families yep. there's more women who are, who are coming up or people yep. joining their spouses and bringing their children and so what are the chances that the farm worker community that's in the shadows right now will consider themselves better Montanos, Vermonters <laughs> in the future? Uh, very good chance. <laughs> so to your first question there have been efforts to bring dairy work into the H-2A program um, there was something called the Farm Worker Modernization Act that was, for various reasons, like bouncing all around Congress and Senate, um, it ultimately was struck down. Um, Leahy would, has been long in support of expanding the H-2A program to include farm workers. Organizations like the United Farm Workers, you know, Historic Union, um, were very in support of that policy. They felt like that was going to be an important solution to some of these issues, but Migrant Justice and many other groups were adamantly opposed to that um, legislation, in large part because they don't see the H-2A program as a model, uh -huh. right? that they actually want to rework the H-2A program as well. So I think there's different ways of legalization or work authorization that, like, to stick it into something that, just because it's there, doesn't actually make that much sense if you look at some of the issues with that program. But I do think that some kind of work program wouldn't be the worst idea, right? And and what that would look like is, you know, for people to get paid much higher than I do to make policies. Um, the second question of, you know, will people consider themselves or not I haven't heard that, but I love that. Um, that's happening, right? And that there are families with US-born children. Those US-born children are going to Vermont schools. Um, those parents are opening up small businesses. And, you know, I think if you look at, you know, the sort of historic processes of migration, you know, I was, I did my PhD in Seattle, and if you look at Western Washington, you know, you have the Braceros there, and then over time, right, those communities become, um, become third generation, fourth generation. And I, I have no doubt that that will happen here. I also think and know that people are gonna move out of the dairy industry. Right, that people are going to find work and are finding work in other industries rather than dairy. Um, so um, what that means um, is that, you know, are we going to have a large number of our dairies using robotic milkers? Maybe. <laughs> um, that's, that's happening a lot in California um, as work is harder to come by. Um, and I, you know, I think that Vermont's known as a newer destination migration. You know, that's kind of the category that we're in. But if we look at generations of, you know, whether we call new Americans or refugees, right? These were now generations into families of Vietnamese, you know, immigrants in the Burlington area, um, and the landscape of the city is different because of that. And as a food anthropologist, I'm thrilled <laughs> for those options. Uh, the message I get from you is that our, our real problem is immigration. I think um, our immigration system is very flawed. And I also, one of the things that, when I think about what is the root problem, and I think there's many root problems, what I think is that our food policies and our agricultural policies and our immigration policies are totally out of sync, mm -hmm. right? And that at the same time, our food system is dependent upon the exploitation of workers. That's what keeps it going. Eric Holt Jimenez, who is the former director of Food First, says, our food system isn't broken, it works, it's working exactly how it was designed to do. So I think immigration and immigration policies are certainly one of the issues, but I also think there's this reality of poverty that people are, are getting away from. Right? and that some of that poverty is created by trade policies that the U.S. has been a party to. And so what we know is that following NAFTA, 1.3 million Mexicans were forced off their land. 
And so where did those people go? They went into urban areas of Mexico and they came into the United States. It's estimated that probably, you know, anywhere between, the, the estimates were very all over the place, but four to 12 million Mexicans have migrated as a result of NAFTA. And so, yes, it's immigration, but it's also about what are the economic conditions in the places that people are coming from? Because who wants to leave their family? Right? Who wants to leave the thing that is familiar and known to them? It is because there are very few economic options. And so immigration is, to me, like if we look at the pyramid, immigration is part of it, but then fundamental causes of what are, what are the causes that people have to migrate? Because it's very rarely a choice. And a great question. Any questions from the from the online? Yes. I haven't seen it. Okay. Well, thank you so much for spending the evening with me. Um, it's really enjoyable for me to kind of. This is a little bit of like a sneak preview into the book that's coming. Um, it's due on May thirty first. Um, that's really close. <laughs> we have a lot more to write. Um, but the title of the book is going to be "Will Work for Food: um, uh, Food Work Across the Food System or Labor Across the Food System." Um, it's under advanced contract with the University of California Press, and if all goes well, we're hoping it's out in 2024. That's the plan. So maybe I'll be back then. <laughs>